more about kind of what you, you know, what's going on in the boat that you guys hook up with that then helps people stay understanding what's going on down there, even if they're not at the boat. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And it's this year's going to be a big year for us. We have the International Boat Builders Expo coming up where we're going to release the uh, first consumer edition of, of really the full connectivity. And that means not just being connected to your bilge pump or to your high water sensor or entry, it's really connecting to, to CAN bus, which is just, it's the network that connects the motors and your plotter and your GPS. Everything on the boat, mechanical or electromechanical, comes through this network, and we can now connect to that. So when we talk about the connected boat, which is a term that we're, we're very excited that we've been awarded a trademark uh, trademark for from the U.S. Uh, Patent Office is we actually connect to everything on the boat that you might be interested in. Where is my boat? Um, how fast is it going? What's the temperature? Is my engine running? What are my engine hours? So, that, so also when you're using the boat, so it's because people Absolutely. might think it's only when you're not there. You have an application for when you're on the boat and you're figuring out what's going on, as well as when you're not at the boat to, to check what's going on. That's exactly right. Yeah. So what do you find? What are people using it for the most right now to sort of help people imagine, you know, if they had a boat or maybe they do have a boat and they're yeah. wondering about it. What do you find people most like about uh, having this new level of connectivity? Yeah, well, it's uh, it's very interesting because it's, it's, it's different for geographic region in the United States. So in Southeast United States, Florida in particular, people are concerned about theft, they're concerned about uh, their electronics or their motors getting stolen. Up here in New England, that's not as big a problem. It's becoming more of a problem. But right now, it's basically, um, is my boat dragging anchor? Is my, are my batteries up because we're out at a mooring? Is my, is my bilge running? Those kinds of things. On the West Coast, it's a combination of those two. On the Great Lakes, ironically, one of the biggest boating centers in the world. We don't think about that because we're on the ocean here. But yeah. the Great Lakes, there is a ton of boating. And they're concerned about, uh, about break-ins. They're concerned about, is my shore power off, which is keeping your refrigerator going and, and other systems and your battery charger to keep your batteries up. So it's very interesting. We've been doing this for a long time. So we kind of specialize our marketing or focus our marketing on different pain points uh, or different points of interest throughout throughout the country. And we're seeing some of the alerts that people can get, and which I think these videos you guys have put together kind of give people a sense of the idea you're, you know, you wish you're on your boat, but you're stuck at work. Exactly. And then suddenly, boop, you get a you get a beep there and it tells you, oh, there's something going on down there. Look, someone just ran by and took off the shore power. Um, and this this is not something that existed not too many years ago, obviously, with the no, technology. I, I'd like to say that Sire Marine is absolutely a pioneer in this. I, I built the first prototypes in 2006. And uh, there was no Internet of Things. People weren't talking about that. In 2006, uh, cell phones could text message. And our very first devices, you know, our, our boat show would say, you know, can your boat text? To get people going, what do you mean, can my boat text? And we'd say, well, now your boat can text you if there's a problem. So we've come a long way from there. Um, but yeah, connect connectivity is a big part of it, and the texting is, is where it all started. So, um, how is business? You know, are people are people is this catching on fast? You know, I, again, I love the comparison with Nest because most people have a house, and it feels like those those kind of technologies have taken off gangbusters in recent years. Are you seeing that level of uptake in the in the boating industry? Absolutely, and we we, we love the Nest analogy for all kinds of things. We we track it, and uh, this will be, I think, our first really explosive year where because of the success of Nest, because of connected cars, people have an app for everything. One of the questions we ask people are, do you have an app for your boat? Yeah. And the answer is most of the time, no. Well, wouldn't you, because you've got a, a, an app for everything else. Mm -hmm. So um, again, 2006 was a long time ago. 2011 is where we incorporated. Um, we've been in Rhode Island since about 2012. We, we came right over um, from where we started in Mystic. Uh, we won the, the 2012 business plan competition and had to move here to, uh, to fully participate in that. It was kind of a journey we planned anyway. Um, but the, the, the connected world we now live in is driving people to ask that question. Why don't I have an app for my boat? And we've had it for a long time, but now the adoption is just taking off. So in a way, you were there before the consumer uh, was thinking about it as much, and now that they are, you're like, yep, eggs, and we're ready for you. We're ready, exactly. <laughs> so um, can you give people a sense of how expensive is a system, or I'm, I know there's varying types of systems to the degree sure. you want to go, but are we just talking about you know, big fancy yachts? Are we talking about the, the guy with a little motorboat who, who you know, he loves it on the weekends? You know, who, are you, who are you targeting? Love that question, because it, it's often perceived as this is for yachts, this is for big boats, and absolutely that is not the right answer. Uh, most big boats have a crew, so there's someone actually on the boat all the time anyway. This is for really any boat that has a motor and a battery and an active user, someone that cares about their boat that wants to go boating so that you don't arrive to your 18-foot Boston whaler on a Saturday to go out fishing with your buddies and the boat's full of water and the battery's dead. 
So it's really for any boat that you have an owner that wants to know that the boat's ready to go when he's ready to go use the boat. The size really doesn't matter. Boat, motor, battery, it's perfect for a submarine system. So what's it going to cost you to do the, the base level of getting some of this going? And then what are you, what are you offering at the, the top end for somebody who wants to soup up the entire boat, you know, soup, get everything possible? Right. So the, the, the system is, is $599 for the unit itself. That communicates position, battery level, and tracking. And then you can add on either wireless sensors or wired sensors to build out really as extensive a system as you could dream up. Um, so for, say, $1,000 installed with a few sensors, you're good to go. So it really is for the every man's boat out here in Narragansett Bay that wants to make sure that you arrive at a boat ready to enjoy and not to jumpstart the battery or bail it out. Yeah, I think we all know boat owners who would say uh, they used to think 599 was a lot of money, and now with a the boat, they're like, "That's <laughs> you're oh, yeah. lucky to get off a boat oh, yeah. only spending 600." That's, that's on one something. fill up of, of the gas, <laughs> right. you know. Yeah, or, exactly. So um, tell us a little bit about your background, where the idea came from for this originally. Yeah, well, we we need a longer show for the whole story, but I'll give the cliff notes. Um, in in college, I, I've been in computers for my whole life and software. In college, I had a uh, software business that was, again, about five years ahead of when we were developing software for the legal and medical industry that uh, weren't using computers yet. So that, that didn't quite take off, and I decided to go sailing. Um, for a few years after college, that turned into an 18-year adventure <laughs> on boats, um, sailing in and out of Newport primarily, too, which really developed my love for Rhode Island and Newport. And then uh, during that career as a professional captain, I discovered that, hey, all boaters worry about their boats. We're not on them a lot more than we're actually on them. We're out working, trying to get back to the boat. <laughs> and when we get back to the boat, often the batteries are dead or, or it's been broken into or it's dragging anchor or it's not where we left it or any of these things that are ubiquitous among boat owners. So kind of you know, put my technology thinking hat back on and said, cell phones are now pretty much in everyone's pockets. Text messaging seems like a technology that if we could connect that to batteries and bilge, which is the first prototype, if I could just get a text message from my boat saying, hey, your batteries are low, well, I can go deal with that before I arrive ready to use it and the batteries are completely dead. So that's, that's where it all started. All right, we're going to take a break. We come back. We're going to talk much more with Dan Harper about Siren Marine and what they're doing with the Internet of Things and the connected boat. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Stuff. Sounds good. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. We're talking to Dan Harper. He is the founder and CEO of Siren Marine. They make technology, uh, they call it the connected boat to get your boat so it can tell your cell phone if the, if the shore power has gone out or if you're on the boat, you can get all the information. I explain it right there uh, a little exactly bit. That's exactly right. What you're doing yeah. there. So um, I don't own a boat, but I know quite a few folks who do. And as I alluded to, some of them, it seems like half their time is spent fixing the boat or dealing with an issue on the boat, and they're not actually sailing the boat, boating, you know, the reason they, they got a boat in the first place. Far, far truer than we, we like to admit. Yeah, do you see this, when I think of those folks and the, the for, oh, I was going to go on the boat, but I ended up, you know, cleaning the bilge unexpectedly or something. Do you think, is this just going to help people deal with the same things that they already are dealing with, or do you think... If people use this technology, it actually will reduce the amount of time boat owners are spending on unexpected things. As you said, so they can just go out fishing like they expected, not spend three hours before they get out there fixing right. some problem they didn't expect. Now, we, 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 we believe, we have a deep conviction that this technology is going to create a better boating experience. Not just for the consumer, for the boat builder, for the motor manufacturer, for every stakeholder in the marine industry that's part of a boat. Um, if, if you can get ahead of these, these problems are very common. They're all far, they're all too common actually. Um, and most of them, if you had a heads up that something wasn't going right or something was kind of off, you could go deal with it before it became a problem. It was just, a, a, it was a symptom of a problem. Um, we completely believe that this is going to foster a better boating experience and really a, a better boating industry. But, you know, one of the things I like to think about is would you actually design a boat differently or would you design a motor differently if you knew it was going to be connected? Hmm. Could you start to bring artificial intelligence into what we're doing, which we are doing, so that the boat doesn't just tell you about something that potentially is going wrong or is wrong. Could the boat take corrective actions on its own? And there's some exciting stuff we're working on right now that the boat's not going to start making decisions for people, but the boat is going to be able to start looking at data and really granular data that might it might do something a little differently on your own, especially when you're running. And that was what you were talking about earlier. It's not just when you're off the boat. There are things we're doing now that I mean, with, with, with modern technology, with the, we're in our third generation product. There's no other person in our space, no other company in our space 
they're all still getting started with first generation products. We're in our third, which is uh, utilizing all the latest IoT technologies and, and techniques. So we, we IoT is Internet of Things. The Internet the of Things, things yeah. yes, exactly, which in 2006 wasn't a thing. Right. So <laughs> we didn't know that's what we were building, but it turns out we've actually built a very sophisticated IoT company specializing in the marine industry. It reminds me a little of, of what we see happening with cars. A friend of mine got a new car recently and he has the CarPlay, the sort of way your right. iPhone connects right into your car and it's it totally has revolutionized kind of how he uses his dashboard Absolutely. and everything and it sounds like you're you're kind of looking at the same thing like the the core of the boating experience should be the same if anything you hope it'll get better correct but we can totally change how you deal with these these pain points or the the fundamentals of managing it correct I mean you can deal with them now in advance rather than purely reactive yeah you can now be proactive about a battery that's getting low because you know about it yeah it's it's, it's surprising how much boat uh, folks with boats are just not in the know right now until yeah. things have gone sideways on absolutely them. did you it's, deal with that a lot as a captain I did, and right. that, was, that was really the catalyst. Is like, and, and then as I started just talking about the ideas and these circumstances, I was like, wow, everyone has the same concerns. Everyone has the same 15 core problems they deal with that then create other problems. But the, the core things that we are mitigating with what we do, are there's like five or six major ones, and that impacts a lot of other things. So you mentioned you had a tech industry background on one hand, but you also uh, were doing boating professionally for years. Uh, I'd imagine that you feel like you needed both sides. You couldn't have made this a success if you didn't have both sides of that Correct. in your background, right? Yeah, yeah. We, we have a saying around the office. Um, uh, the majority of our company, we're 25 full-time here in, uh, in Rhode Island, right in Newport, and the majority of our employees um, are, have an active boating life um, or lifestyle. And so we, we often say, you know, this is a company by boaters for boaters. And one of the big differentiators between our company and most of the other ones is there's a, you know, we have awesome engineers who, but they understand what we're doing. And they're the, some of the smartest engineers I've ever come across in my life. But the difference in between our really smart engineers and someone else's really smart engineers is that our engineers have a deep understanding of boating from experience. And it makes all the difference in the world when you try to s provide a solution through engineering um, with a deep knowledge of the problem you're solving. And, and someone just didn't give you a project and say, okay, build me this with no real understanding of what the end result was supposed to be. When you have that deep personal understanding of the problem from experience, you can build technology that's so much better than just executing against a you know a work order. Yeah, not theoretical to them because exactly. they, they know the boating world. So uh, you mentioned you founded the company in 2011. So you've been, you've been at this a little while. Uh, I'm always curious for folks who who have and had startups. Uh, what were some of the biggest surprises when you were first starting out? What didn't you expect? What took you by uh, What took you by surprise? Everything, <laughs> no. um, a lot. So interestingly enough, our mission statement in 2011. Uh, we were just looking at, we, we try to keep it up to date. It hasn't changed that much in, in li literally a decade, the things that we're really focused on trying to do. The hurdles along the way are, um, you know, we're, we're growing quite fast. We're a company of 25. We started, you know, as a company of one, and then we were a company of five, and then it was up and down and up and down. And then for the last couple of years, we've been in a very steady growth rate. Um, as you're developing technology, is very expensive to development when you're out in front, especially, and you're drawing and not tracing, um, when you're spending those R&D dollars, it's very expensive. Um, so keeping up with funding is always a challenge. Keeping up with funding to, to build technology that is ahead of your competitors um, is something that we've done organically just because there is no one to follow. So, um, but now that, now that there's a bunch of people following us, we've got to be extra careful with our ideas. We've got to make sure that we're rolling things out at the right pace. We try really hard not to roll something out before it's tested. So the balance of growing the company, managing the company, I used to do most of the, at least the overall architecture along with you know really smart code guys that were much smarter than I was. Um, now I'm doing a lot more managing the company and not actually doing you know those things. So that's a transition for me. <laughs> Classic yeah. change for a boss. Exactly, yep. exactly. <laughs> All right, we're gonna take another break. We come back on Executive Suite. We're gonna talk some more about Siren Marine and how Rhode Island helped to spur the company's growth. Stick with us on Executive Suite.
Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. We're talking today about the business of boating with Dan Harper. He's the founder and CEO of Siren Marine out of Newport. They make technology that helps boat owners keep track of their boats using their phones to track both when they're at the boats and when they're not at the boats. Dan, you mentioned earlier um, you actually started the company in Florida and fairly quickly wound up here in Rhode Island, probably because you won the business plan competition. I always keep an eye on who wins those because you never know where those companies That's will right. wind up. That's right. How how important was that winning that competition? That was the 2012 Rhode Island business plan competition, I believe, right? Yeah. Was that the right year? That was 2012. That's 2012. Yeah. How uh, important was that to your growth? Uh, it was it was essential actually, and uh, well, critical maybe is, is the better term. So the company is is uh, is registered in Florida. Um, we do a ton of business in Florida. We have an office there, but we really kind of have lived in New England. Um, at least about half of that time. So we, st we were in Mystic and then won the Rhode Island Business Plan competition and then part of the deal is you gotta be in Rhode Island to, to collect. So we moved very quickly. Uh, which was actually part of our, 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 our uh, roadmap anyway, because I'm, I'm a passionate sailor, Newport was the place. It just accelerated us getting to Newport um, a little bit quicker than what we had planned to do. But I, but I, I have to say that the, the state has been tremendous for us. And the accelerator programs, the access to Stephen Pryor in particular has been a huge fan. He's been to our offices three or four different times. He's organized meetings with other um, partners that, that's helped us grow. And it's helped us get in front of uh, some very important um, players and contracts and things that have been great for the company. So uh, Rhode Island has been uniquely significant in our growth and acceleration. Um, and especially having access to and the support of the state, it's just been tremendous. And you know, uh, people uh, watching the show always wonder like, how do we get more companies like the one we're listening to today? What advice, would, whether it's to Stephen Pryor or, or anybody else uh, listening, what advice would you give for, you know, as you think through both what's gone well and the pain points as you've grown a company, a small company that's getting bigger in Rhode Island, uh, what, would, what advice would you be? What would you tell state leaders to work on? Yeah, well, I would, I would tell it to the state leaders for sure, yeah. not just the entrepreneurs, but um, mainly, you know, keep doing those things that are working. The, uh, the programs that have helped us hire, which have been uh, tremendous, and significant. Um, I don't know that I could have grown as quickly as we have without state assistance. And the programs are set up so that they have people that come and help you through the paperwork, which is not nearly as bad as I thought it would be. <laughs> Typically, you weigh those times of opportunities against the requirements to get the grant or to get the assistance, and have the time you just say, "I don't. I've got to. I've got to work. I don't have time to do that." So uh, I would say really promote those those hiring programs. They work great. Um, uh, keep just keep doing what they're doing really and if there was one thing I would say do more of would be I've, I've pointed a lot of my entrepreneur friends towards these programs because they just didn't know they were there so I mean for the state of Rhode Island uh, <laughs> make sure that you're promoting the great programs that are there and in place. So part of your message then is actually to fellow entrepreneurs who are a little wary, you know, it feels in the business side, a little wary of getting involved with state government, what's the paperwork going to be, right. et cetera, that it actually, at least if you pick the right programs that are going to work for you, was it's it's worth it and not as bad as you thought to, to try to get involved with those. That's correct. So the other question people are going to have is, you know, sometimes we have a company growing and uh, they get big enough and they say, okay, we're gone. And, you know, how as you look longer term, kind of what's the outlook for the company and how likely is it you continue to grow the company in new Porter in Rhode Island generally. Yeah, no, I mean, we, we have no plans of leaving. Matter of fact, I think if I did, I'd have a revolt on my hands back at back at HQ. I mean, we, we really are a company by boaters, for boaters. We love living in, in Rhode Island. We love living in Newport. We're very active on the waterfront. Uh, we're racing, sailing, fishing. Um, it's it's really, I, I'm pretty sure I'd have a mutiny if I decided to leave. But, you know, if, if the state continues to do the things that they are, you know, bringing Virgin in, bringing some of these other big companies that I know they've worked hard um, competing against Massachusetts and Connecticut to win that business, um, I think what's happening right now is an excellent direction and they need to keep doing that. And if they do, and fostering innovation is a big deal for Rhode Island. Um, we, we have a brand new innovation center in Newport. It's a gorgeous building. It was an old, uh, beautiful brick schoolhouse. Uh, they did a fantastic job with that. I was just there at the uh, Rhode Island Offshore Wind Summit. Um, we had GE Capital there. We had lots of international players looking at the state of Rhode Island to bring innovation to and to, to foster innovation here. As long as we keep our eye on innovation, keep things moving uh, in the right direction, keep those programs going and, and remain accessible, Rhode Island has some, some huge advantages over states like Connecticut and Massachusetts that are just bigger. You know, there's, there's, there's more complexity to it that makes it more difficult for, a, you know, a startup or a young entrepreneur to become aware of these things or to get the attention of the Secretary of Commerce or to 
um, you know, have someone come to your office to walk you through the programs that are available. Um, and then, you know, the communications is super important. The ability to actually have a conversation and say, hey, we, we're looking to hire some more people. What can you guys do to help us? And we get answers. Um, you, also, you're looking at the marine uh, trades all over the country, all over the world, really, as you look at your business. How, uh, how important is the fact that you're part of sort of an ecosystem? You know, every state, every metropolitan area looks for, you know, what do we have kind of a killer edge in? What do we, what do we have a lot going on in? And certainly maritime has always been something important right. around the rest of southeastern New England. Um, you know, is that important for you to have other companies in this space around you, too? No, I, I'd like to have no other companies in my space. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, the, the lack of competition would be a terrible thing. And, yeah. and fortunately, there are some reasonably mature companies. They're just not nearly as good. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I say that both uh, tongue-in-cheek, but it's, it's actually we are considerably far ahead. I didn't, I didn't fully answer your last question, too, and, and I should. Um, we plan on staying in Rhode Island. We love being here. Um, we have distribution in Australia, throughout Europe, South America, the Caribbean. Um, we actually have a very large global uh, footprint. Our, our cellular provider is Vodafone, um, which we're thrilled to death at. We, we exhibit at the uh, Marine Equipment Trade Show in Amsterdam. So we, we're really everywhere. Um, but there's no reason that we would ever need to leave with good relationships that we have in the state and the state structure that we're working within, even to support a, a global business. Just under a minute left. So uh, looking ahead, what are you excited about? Where do you see the biggest opportunity for growth for you guys? Yeah, it's data. So, you know, the saying is uh, data is the new oil. And uh, we're banking on that. We really believe it. And, and when data is done correctly, it is the best thing for the consumer possible. It's that ability to take your boating experience, put some data behind it, put some services behind it, and make it so that you, you know that something's happening on your boat. Maybe you can't go deal with it, but maybe your service provider can because they have access to that alert, to that data, to that uh, notification that one of their customers has a boat that has a problem, and they can make sure that you have that better boating experience based on data. So data is absolutely the future. All right, boat owners. Well, Dan Harper from Siren Marine is going to make sure you're not surprised by your bilge anymore, right? That's right. <laughs> Thanks for joining <laughs> us, Dan, and thank you for being with us on this week's episode of Executive Suite. Remember, you can always catch all the episodes on WPRI.com and on our podcast on iTunes. See you back here next week.